So if we're going to look then at the interpretation of a text, what we need to identify are the actors and the stage in which that act is beginning to happen. You need to imagine that every piece of text, every part of Tanakh is, is a part of a, a play, is part of a drama. And what we need to look at is saying, who are the actors within this drama? And of course, in every drama, the, the action is not just what's happening on the stage. The action is also in the audience. And not just in the audience, but if it's being filmed, as in, or written down, what you're seeing is that the action will continue to happen in an audience in the future as well. And so all those things are the actors within each passage. And you need to hold on to those different passages or those concepts in order to understand them. Now, in order to identify the different actors, the different uh, parts of the play, the different characters and so on, that process of trying to work all that out from a text, of looking through the exegesis of a text, is actually called the process called criticism. Criticism. Now, often when we think of the word criticism, we, we're talking about being negative about some, someone. So when someone's being critical about us, then we say, well, they're being negative to us. But that's not the concept in biblical understanding of the word criticism. Criticism in biblical studies, as in any kind of literary, literary criticism, is really wanting to say, how do we unpack what's there? How do we look at who the actors are? How do we look at who, what the play is? the words of the play, how do we see how that play will be received? Those are things that we do within criticism. And there are many different forms of criticism, some of which you will see within the notes to this particular module. But I want to tell you that there's a, a couple of different ones that we need to identify particularly. The first one we need to look at is looking at the play itself in its particular context. And so some of those is looking at things like the audience. Who was the audience for this particular play? Who, who, for this particular text, who was it written to? Who was it written for? That's a very important question because one of the things with that is that we actually understand a little bit more about what the person was trying to achieve when we understand who they were writing it to. If we look at Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon where we lay down, obviously who is the, the audience? Well, the original audience was the exiles, or were the exiles, the people who, who were there in exile, having lost the land and the temple and all those things, and now being asked to share their traditions with, with these pagans, with these non-Jews around them. And you can see that, in fact, all that pathos, all the, the emotion, all the grief that is within Psalm 137 is connected to who that audience is. However, of course, that audience now, if we read 137 now, we don't have that same reaction to it because we're a different audience. So therefore, knowing who the audience is makes a very big difference in terms of that process. The other one are, who are the actors? Essentially, who's the characters? Who are the characters involved in the particular story? If God's involved, what is it wanting to tell us about God? Uh, sometimes even when God's not involved, it's, it's telling us something about God, as we can see, for example, in the book of Esther. When we look at the actors, when we look at David, when we look at Abraham, so often we get ourselves caught up in the historical perspective of those people that we forget that they are actors, that they are playing a role within the text. And unless we can see the role that they're playing with it in the text, often we can miss interpret what the text is trying to tell us itself. Then, of course, we've got the, the stage. And another word for the stage, we could say, is the, is the context. So the context of the writing, the context in which this is taking place. If we don't understand context, again, so often we can misinterpret a particular passage. Think of Psalm 23. For us here in Australia, at least in this eastern or the, the coastal part of Australia or in, uh, in the Pacific Islands, we read Psalm 23, and particularly in Australia, we all know about shepherds, so it's no big deal. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside green uh, pools and pastures. When we look at that, we ask ourselves, well, what's the big deal? But you need to pull yourself back into Israel and realize that that's a Psalm of David. What was David looking at? 
He wasn't looking at green pastures and pools of still water. He was looking at a desert. There was nothing green for miles and miles. So when he says it, understanding his particular context is a vital. Because what Psalm 23 then wants to tell us is a very simple word. It's wanting to say that in fact the Lord is my shepherd. He will lead me to paradise. He'll lead me to the place that I can only imagine in my wildest dreams. In my wildest hopes, I can imagine those things. That's what God can, can lead us to. Now when we see it like that, when we understand it like that, all of a sudden we realize, wait a second. David's talking about something much more profound here than just green grass and still waters. When we realize that, we realize that the stage is important. And setting that stage is important as well. What that stage is going to be like and how it's going to be understood. The last area that we need to see are the actual words then of the play. The words that the act will bring us. And the words you can think of is the literary, the literary forms that we have. And the literary forms that we have, we've talked about in a previous module, the different forms of writing that we have, the different ways in which it's there, the concept of whether it is Torah or Nevi'im or Ketuvim. Each of those are going to have a different application. We'll have to have different tools applied to them. When we look at so much of what, we've, what we're looking at in terms of, of interpretation, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine always used to say that there's no problem that can't be fixed with a hammer. <laughs> well, the truth of it is, is that a hammer doesn't fix all problems. Sometimes you need more tools than just a hammer. You need the screwdriver, and you need a wrench, and you need a spanner. In different times, you need different tools. Each of those different tools are the different forms of criticism. And what we need to see is that not one form is above another form, but rather they are different tools in a toolbox of, of, of things that you can apply to each, each a, a text. Whether you're looking at the source criticism, so where a text would come from, whether you're looking at a form criticism, in looking at the way or the type of writing, the form of writing, if you're looking at a socio-rhetorical criticism, where you're actually looking at what was the social environment then, Maybe you're even wanting to look at the current audience and apply it from within the current audience in feminist application or maybe even a liberationist perspective. Each of these are tools. Please, let's not think that it's one tool fits every situation. It's rather that there are different tools to apply to different situations and sometimes multiple tools to apply to a particular text. When we use each of those, when we are aware of each of those, that's what we're able to do in terms of interpreting the text. We're able to see who the audience is. We're able to look at who the actors are. We're able to look at the stage which is set. And we're able to look at the words that are used to convey those meanings and those perspectives. When we do all of those things, what we begin to do is to get a deeper understanding, a deeper perspective of what that text is trying to teach of what God's trying to lead us into through His relationship with us and through the Holy Spirit's guidance. 